Here's our scripture today. By the way, I, I sometimes have two or three sermons that I'm working on at the same time that are in my mind that I want to preach. And I had, uh, I had two that I was thinking about for today. And uh, poor Jason, I kept sending him new, new sermon titles. He got the latest one this morning before worship. Uh, <laughs> people who watch that changing are going to be wondering whether I'm going to preach on all of them at one time. Well, anyway, here are, I always have notes for my sermons. I, I don't look at them, but I have notes. And here, here are the notes for uh, my sermon today. Unfortunately, this isn't the sermon I'm preaching. So, <laughs> so I don't have any notes for the sermon that I'm preaching. I don't know why I was so wishy-washy about what I was going to say today. Maybe the other sermon, uh, I don't know, maybe it took more energy or something, and I don't have a lot of that today, but I've just been back and forth. But I've also been thinking about the wonder of faith and the wonder of belief. And there's this extraordinary line from the Apostle Paul. By the way, I was reading in C.S. Lewis, one of his books. i tell you which one it was, but I don't remember. Could have been the great divorce. I don't know. And uh, he said that uh, Paul is a universalist. Now, not a Unitarian universalist. That's what our good friends over here on the other street are at uh, First Jefferson uh, Unitarian Church. But he was a universalist. What does it mean to say that somebody is a universalist? What does it mean? It means they believe that he is saying Paul is a universalist. C.S. Lewis is. He's saying that they believe that eventually everyone will be saved. Paul never mentions the word hell in all of his letters. Not that there's not one. He doesn't talk about it. He also uses the word all frequently in talking about salvation. And he has these remarkable words in his letter to the Philippians. And I want you to listen to them and consider what he must be saying here. Therefore, he's been saying some other things. Therefore, God has highly exalted the Lord and gave him a name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bend. Now get this next line. In heaven... And on earth and under the earth. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of Paul about our Lord Thanks be to God. Remarkable words there. I think Paul would have agreed with the idea that all of us are on a journey. We're all moving in the direction of God. Now some are going to take a detour. And it may be hot and uncomfortable where they are. But I actually don't believe that God is going to lose anybody forever. Now, I get nervous when I say that because some people have so many people they want to see in hell. You know that's true. <laughs> I got a wonderful email from Danny Dietrich, one of our former choir directors who was here for many years and whom I love dearly. And I, I see... Uh, 
I see some folks already smiling over here about Danny. It was a wonderful email. And he told me I was, uh, he told me I was brave. And I met a preacher at an annual conference who told me I was brave. Now, I don't know why people think I'm brave. I'm simply convinced. I'm simply convinced, and I simply say what I am convinced of, and I know in my heart that God loves everybody and that everybody belongs to God, that we are all made from God, and that God is not going to lose any of us forever. Yeah, it's going to be hard on some people for a while, maybe an aeon or two, But the truth is, I believe Paul when he says, the time will come when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And what do you call that? You call that salvation. Whether you are in heaven, on the earth, or the place where they considered hell to be, which was under the earth. We now know there's nobody under the earth, but we know what Paul's reference is to. Salvation. Everyone is on this journey. I have a couple of friends who are atheists, and they are, um, they are high intensity atheists. They are very, very reluctant for God to exist. One of them tells me he's looked and looked. <laughs> he's looked in all the wrong places. And I know the books he reads. This is a former youth group member, so I used to teaching, both in school and in, in the church youth group. So it's probably my fault he's an atheist. Uh, he, didn't, he, didn't listen, or he didn't listen to me. No, it's not my fault. Uh, he's a wonderful person, and uh, he's never going to hell, but he also doesn't believe. And he says he's looked, but I'll tell you what he's not ever done. He has never said, with his heart, whole heart in it, God, you let me know that you are there because I really want to know you. Because anyone who prays that prayer, it's going to be answered. Because everybody at some time, I don't know, care whether you're Richard Dawkins, who's the atheist who writes all the anti-God books. I don't care who you are. You are eventually going to run into God. Why? Because God is real. I've been reading a book uh, called In My Time of Dying by a really wonderful news reporter named Sebastian Junger. I saw him interviewed on TV, uh, I think on, uh, well, I'm not sure who it was. But anyway, I saw him interviewed and I found out he had written this book and I Uh, My sister ordered it immediately because I told her I wanted it, and she's better at ordering books than I am. She's better at computer stuff. I can order a book. Just too lazy to. Anyway, here's the book, (laughs) In My Time of Dying. And uh, (laughs) he was raised by a wonderful family, a loving mother and father. His father may have been a little little bit distant, overly proper. He was a scientist. Um... And he did not believe in God. He was a rationalist and uh, never even considered the idea that there could be a God. Just didn't work into the whole scheme of things scientifically. And uh, Sebastian grew up believing the same thing. He had never even considered that there is is a God or that there is life after death. Now, now can, can you imagine that? I have trouble imagining that because it feels like I have believed all of my life. Even when I was a kid in church uh, at Becker Methodist Church out in the country outside of Kemp when I was growing up, I I, I listened uh, in an extraordinary way to the sermons. I've always been attracted to it. I remember when I was uh, in about the eighth grade, I used to genuinely believe that the sun shone differently on Sunday mornings. It was brighter and more golden. It's scientifically, we know that's not true, but I had just, I was getting, going to get to go to church. I've always been a church person all of my life. 
Sometime when nobody else in the, in the family was going to church, my daddy would have to take me to, to First Baptist. I was a Baptist as a teenager. Everybody should be a Baptist for a while in their life. I was a Baptist as a teenager and, uh, and then uh, went, went back to the Methodist church. But I have always, I once said in one of my little columns, uh, I never had a conversion experience. And someone wrote in and said, I didn't think you had. <laughs> well, I, you know, I could call some experience that I've had with God and a conversion experience, but they were not. I had no time when I didn't believe. So somebody who has lived their whole life until their early 50s, and they've never even considered the idea of God, is astounding to me. He was 51, 52, uh, in great health. He was an athlete. He ran. He, was re he really is a wonderful writer. But his understanding of life, at least before something happened to him, was this. Dying is the most ordinary thing you can do and also the most radical. Like birth, dying is its own timetable and cannot be thwarted and so requires neither courage nor willingness, though both may help. Death annihilates us so completely that we might as well not have lived at all. <clears throat> Imagine believing that and still getting up every morning and doing your work. I have an admiration almost for someone like that because they're running on something I ain't got. I have never felt that way. The idea that death completely annihilates you, opposed to our understanding that death actually can do us no harm. <laughs> death has no power over us. There is no such thing as dying. God has made us to last forever. Well, he had this understanding and uh, never expected uh, to die anytime soon. Didn't even expect to get ill because he was in great health and always had been. But then he had been having some trouble with his stomach. Some pains that would come and they would last for a little bit and, and they would go and maybe he'd go for a run and feel better. But then there was one day when he and his wife, they lived on a farm kind of out in the country, had poor cell phone reception. They decided to go to a cabin somewhere behind the house and hire a babysitter for their kid and, and go back there and kind of have a, a day to themselves. And he got back there and not long after he got back there, he was wow in excruciating and sudden pain as if something had blown up in his stomach. And he was in and out of consciousness. His wife managed to walk him somehow back to the house and got him into the truck. She managed to get enough cell service to call the ambulance. And the ambulance came and he, he describes in great detail every medical process that he goes through. In and out of consciousness, his blood pressure dropping to the point where it's just below where it can be and you still live. And at some point while he was in there on the operating table with what turned out to be an aneurysm in a blood vessel that led to his, uh, uh, some organ in his body, okay, uh, an aneurysm in a blood, in a, in a blood vessel, uh, he, he evidently died because first of all, there was this Darkness, seeming void, but then, now, this is what I'm telling you. This reality is unavoidable because it's there. There in that darkness suddenly was his father. His father, who said, son, don't be afraid. You can go ahead and come with me. 
Just relax and come with me. And I will take care of you. And then he went back into unconsciousness. And when he woke up the next day, he was babbling a bit. But then he remembered his father. Now this experience was too real for it not to have happened. And it was like an earthquake in his life. He had no idea how to deal with it. He spent months after that in a mental turmoil, researching near-death experiences, quantum physics, because quantum physics is, I believe, the, the doorway to eternity. And... I'm not going to tell you he landed up in church every Sunday. But he had to deal with this. And it did change. And he says in the last line of the book, he says, I don't know about faith, religion, any of that. He said, but I do know this. When you leave this place, when you die, somebody is going to be waiting for you. The fact that it was his father, I think, was particularly meaningful to him. I know you would expect, since the father was an atheist, that the father would be in hell. It doesn't really work that way. Whenever we say yes to God, whether in this world or that world, that's when the journey of our, our journey to faith picks up a lot of speed. I know a story about a guy who died in a, in a hospital in, in France and he admitted he had been a very mean person and he ended up in a place where there were creatures all over the place that were tearing at him. He knew there were other people like him, but now they were like monsters and their only intent was to hurt other people. And he didn't know what to do. He didn't know who to call on. He, he had never prayed, but he heard a voice which said, a voice which said to him, pray. He said, I don't know how to pray. Finally, he remembered the words to a song he had learned somewhere in his life. Jesus loves me, this I know. And when he called out to Jesus, there was a light that started out from a great distance. And it came and came and came right down into the midst of his darkness. And it took him and lifted him out. And when he was before the angels of heaven, he said... You know, I don't belong here. And Jesus told him, we don't make mistakes. It's good to know someone who doesn't make mistakes. I see by the old clock on the wall, I have time to tell you another story. By the way, you're going to hear that story again when my sister does her, her series, and you'll hear it in more depth. That guy, by the way, became a minister of the gospel. You can, you can understand why. Let me share this with you. Do you remember the time when you first believed? I know I've told you that, that I don't. But some people, some people do. Or they remember the time when they began to take it seriously. You know that line from Amazing Grace? How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. And uh, I talked to a young man years ago who said that he wished he could go back to that moment when he first believed and experience that joy all over again. This is a guy who was an atheist. His name was Don. And very reluctantly, he went to a... Um, 
he went to a religious retreat with a friend of his. He was interested in the friendship, but he wasn't interested in religion at all, and he went kind of kicking and screaming. And at first, nothing that anybody was saying meant anything to him, to this guy named Don. And uh, he wasn't in it interested at all, but, <laughs> but then there came a point where uh, something, something happened inside. Uh, something, something hit him. He didn't know what it was. He didn't know what was going on. Some kind of change was going on. I mean, let's understand that this is a real power. And this power is here with us now. It's available to us. It's a real power. And it changes things. And he, he felt something going on and he started crying. He could not stop crying. He says he grabbed up three rolls of toilet paper and rushed out of the building. Now he must have been crying a lot to need three rolls of toilet paper. I've had a one toilet roll of toilet paper tear jag, but I've never had a three toilet paper tear jag. Well, he ran to a little thing that was the chapel and he went in and he couldn't find the light switch. He looked around for it and here he was crying, carrying his toilet paper, looking for the light switch. He finally found it and he rushed down toward the altar and he knelt there. Let me read it from him. I cried and cried and cried for three hours. It just wouldn't stop. It was the most incredible sadness I have ever felt in my life. Why sadness? Because as in a near-death experience, he saw his whole life flash before him. Actually, not his whole life. He saw all the bad things in his life flash before him. And he was overwhelmed by the sadness. I was on my knees and I was just saying, I cannot believe what is happening. I don't know what is happening. <laughs> Later, I started feeling better and I thought, okay, this is bigger than me. And I looked up and I said, Lord, ah, here are the words that if you don't want to meet him, don't say them. Or you can say them and not really mean it. But if you mean it and say it, either in that moment or sometime later, you're going to get a response because God loves us infinitely, passionately. And he wants us to know him. He wants us to stop doing what most of us do most of the time, living our lives, forgetting that he is there and forgetting that we belong to him. He said to God, okay, Lord, if you exist, show me now. I want to know. And the halo on the oil painting, there was an oil painting above the altar. The halo around the head of Jesus in the oil painting, he said, lit up. Now that may sound kind of fantastic to you, but the truth is, <laughs> what, what, did, what, did, what, what did the angel tell to Mary? All things are possible with God. And God will do whatever it takes to touch us and reach us. Said it lit up. That's all I could see was that halo. It, it lit up. It was like someone had turned a light beam on it. I thought that this was someone playing a trick on me. But when I went back, it must have been four o'clock in the morning. I felt like a new person. Like someone had just taken a big brush and shoved it down my throat and cleaned out everything that was bad inside of me. You know, um, some Christians live in fear. 
that science is going to discover something that will show that Jesus is not Lord and God is not real. They live in that fear and they, and they fight that all the time. That's, that's not the problem. Christians don't face a problem. <laughs> it's those who don't believe who face this problem. They never know at any moment in their lives when the veil that separates them from God will drop and boom, God is before them. Join me in prayer. Dear God of grace and glory, remind us that you are real, that you are here for us, that we don't need to live it on our own because you love us and we belong to you. In Jesus' name, amen.